Well, thank you everyone for being here. My name is Eric Macias Chavez, and I am a student at San Jose State University. Oh. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce our closing speaker for today's program, President of WASC Senior College and University Commission, Jermaine Studley. Oh, Jamie and Studley, my apologies. <laughs> Previously, she was Deputy Undersecretary of the U.S. Department of Education from 2013 to 2016, at times also acting in the positions of Undersecretary and Assistant Secretary for post-secondary education. Her focuses include accreditation and accountability, campus climate issues, and student success strategies. Please join me in welcoming our speaker for this afternoon, President Jamie N. Studley. Thank you very much, Eric. Eric and I have already done um, a little piece of business, a little transfer of social capital. I realized that he would love to meet uh, the only person I know for sure to be a San Diego State graduate, a former student government president here, who was my protege in a role I had in San Francisco as president of a group called Public Advocates. And Guillermo Mayer stands for everything that would make San Diego State happy, and indeed the entire system. And I realized that he and Eric uh, would probably enjoy connecting up. So uh, my visit here is worth it, if I can put these two remarkable young men and in touch with each other. Uh, but it's also been worth it for hearing from you, both from the podium and in the smaller conversations together, for which I really want to thank you. I'm tremendously honored to be here to congratulate this system and all of you individually and the many colleagues back home and listening in for your dedicated work to achieve the graduation initiative goals. The progress across the system in the direction of your ambitions is powerful, and the commitment to continue on this journey that is so evident in your mood and in your work is inspiring. A privilege of the final speaker is that I can draw on what some others have said and the threads and wisdom of those who preceded me. Tim White, revolutionary, rewarding, and right. Those were my favorite three of your R's, um, and they will stick with me. This is the right path. The rewards are enormous, and it is revolutionary to uh, aim so intently um, on these goals of equity and college graduation. And Jeff Gold reminded us of the importance of humanizing the data. Every one of his little icons that he showed us is a person, a family, a life. And I think of all the lives that you are touching in what you are doing and in the change that you are making. I'm also honored because it's a privilege to be with so many leaders in the cause of higher education. In a time of declining faith in institutions generally and questions about the value of higher education in particular, CSU stands as a beacon and an exemplar. The last time I spoke to such a distinguished CSU audience, I was in DC, and your leadership, including Tim and Ellen for sure, were there on a slushy, sloppy, dark morning for a day of congressional visits and briefings. Tim very kindly introduced me as a Californian on temporary duty with the Department of Education. When I said that I was fortunate enough to have a small flat in San Francisco State University territory and a weekend place near Judy at Sonoma State, I think everyone doubted my sanity, that I was in DC fighting the frozen slush, the summer humidity, and what then seemed like an inhospitable political climate. I had no idea. Uh, but for me, it was clear. It was clear why I was doing that and why my husband and I were commuting for the privilege. Because I had a chance to assure that college success is within reach of all of our people. And nobody does it on a larger scale than CSU and your cousins like the CUNY system. That job gave me a chance to work, too, with James Minor, who has been and is now again both my colleague and often my teacher. So thank you, James, and thank you for this invitation. It is a tremendous honor for WASC to be CSU's partner in the work of promoting educational excellence, equity, and the quality, coherence, and meaning of degrees through our shared dedication to student success, very broadly defined, and institutional improvement. 
One of my colleagues sent me off on this trip from Alameda with the words, I cherish CSU and I know you do too. At WASC we work hard to be impartial, but what can I say? We love CSU. This is, a very, this is a very good chance for me to thank the scores of CSU faculty, staff, and presidents, many of whom are here, who contribute so much every year as WASC evaluators and commissioners. And I will name our current CSU commissioners. It's a distinguished group. I know not all of them could stay, but Jeff Armstrong from San Luis Obispo, Jana Bercy from Dominguez Hills, Joe Castro, Fresno, Bill Cavino from LA, Eduardo Ochoa, Monterey Bay, and Jennifer Summit from San Francisco. San Francisco State. It is a distinguished group and we thank you for what you're doing and we thank the system for lending them to us. I was invited to speak today under the title, Why the Nation's Degree Completion Agenda Should Not Offend Protectors of Academic Quality. It wasn't quite my terminology, but the point is certainly true. Academic quality is the heart of what we want our students to have when they graduate and for the rest of their lives. But I changed the title to True Student Success, Expansive Notions of Student Success, for a couple of reasons. To put students and success at the center. This is not a debate about completion or academic quality. It is a conversation about student services. Lauren said it very well. Many of you echoed that. That is what the center is. Adam said it this morning in his closing uh, line. To put students and their success at the center focuses on why we are here and what we are about. Our central value across all of our institutions and our viewpoints on particular language and strategies and changes that might matter is that we begin with a passion for students and learning and to support their learning for lives of meaning and accomplishment. My title also felt a little less oppositional to me. We are all united in seeking true student success. To me, it's not a dichotomy between a broad and rich understanding of student success and the completely natural effort to mark our progress with a crisp, significant set of indicators like graduation and equity. Academic quality is, of course, the essential non-negotiable core component of an education and a degree with meaning. It is also the motive force and the energy behind graduation. Our students come to learn and to understand how to figure things out. They come for the abilities to connect ideas and comprehend large questions, to search out and critically analyze ideas past, present, and future, and for the knowledge and skills of particular disciplines and professions. The joy of mastery and their growth in understanding, in getting answers and then inevitably seeing more questions, are what propel them to return, to stick with it through the bumpy road of learning to the aha moments that they and we as their teachers treasure. The collaboration between WASC and institutions is designed to improve each institution's effectiveness in achieving its mission. Our regional community establishes broad standards to focus attention on mission, planning, program, governance, and sustainability. Our process then relies on campus reflection on mission, program, and results. Program and results. And we ask you to use data to help understand your progress and your challenges in achieving your goals. The most important part of what we do with CSUs is the peer process of inquiry and questioning, of professional interchange and application of judgment in context to help you see yourselves more clearly and across your entire institution. The central inquiry relates to the quality of the academic experience and student learning. And at the same time, we know that we have to add things up to take anecdote and story and human beings to the point that we can see trends and patterns and groups and programs and services in a wider way so that we can serve those individuals. To draw on other speakers again, we help turn insights into actions, promote the intentionality that translates good ideas into palpable improvement, and understand whether all of that effort that all of you put in is yielding results on the things that matter most. 
Let me turn the question around a little differently. Sometimes I am asked whether under pressure to pump up graduation rates, diplomas won't simply be issued willy-nilly without representing real learning and achievement of meaningful standards. That's not just a CSU question or a California question. It is a national question every time the Department of Education, a speaker, a senator, a fund, foundation funder, um, or an education leader said, how can we pursue graduation without destroying the very thing that we are trying to recognize? How will we know students are learning and that there is something behind that piece of paper? For WASC, that question is embodied in our attention to the meaning, quality, and integrity and coherence of the degree, the complete opposite of an empty piece of paper. We respect that wor the work that goes on in assuring those qualities of the academic offerings, and we work with you to assure that every student's degree reflects those fundamental academic components. I believe to my core that every CSU faculty member and advisor and provost and president and student affairs staff member and every WASC visiting team member and commissioner is committed to assuring that these degrees have meaning. The faculty leadership and, accreditor, and accreditors make sure that in our zeal to graduate students, we would not cheapen the precious currency of our degrees. That you would not have applauded the incre increased graduation rates that James told you about yesterday, or Georgia State's African American STEM degree production if you thought those were second-rate degrees. Whatever differences there may be among us about metrics or strategy or resource allocation, let us be united in this. And we can be united also in being constructively critical and pursuing better paths. So let me talk about some of those. I worked on the US Federal Scorecard. It was pretty controversial. It was really interesting. But I was very much a skeptic about the notion that we could capture something as complicated as post-secondary education in a handful of numbers and a few little circles and lines. Um, even after we realized that we couldn't at this point, responsibly rate schools on the basis of what was available to the federal government. I still wondered seriously <clears throat> about compressing college into a few metrics, um, such a complex, multifaceted story using numbers that were inherently imperfect and incomplete. But I have come to appreciate that there is a place for simple, straightforward metrics that cause us to pay attention to a few crisp results. In a phrase of which I was reminded last night reading um, some work that um, I believe she's still here, Jillian Kinsey helped contribute to. The main thing is that the main thing be the main thing. Um, it's attributed to a corporate CEO, but I see Lauren smiling, he may borrow it. Um, so it is with the power of metrics used reasonably, responsibly over time. Here's one national example. <coughs> For too long, so-called selectivity, the ability to turn away applicants, has been a leading metric in ranking schools. You are better if you reject more people. With the advent of the scorecard and a refreshed national conversation and things like a New York Times rating of wealthy high graduation rate schools by their Pell enrollment, more people started asking about Pell enrollment and more schools started to work on increasing those efforts. They may still never come close to contributing to the education of Pell eligible students the way CSU does, but they may be better able to do their jobs. I know Ellen will tell me Stanislaus will still have the record uh, for Pell enrollment, but they are asking a better question and they are rotated towards something that actually matters much more than that metric of um, ad admissions rejections. So he, in this context, concentrating on graduation rates puts a sharp focus on a critical result that captures many, many human beings with their individual behaviors, variations, stories, and realities. The simple measure, though, is the starting point for vital conversations about what we can change, where those measures are stubborn, what can move it upward while honoring academic standards and the individuality of experience. <clears throat> And critically, concentrating on a shared measure 
compels us to work together across a whole institution. We can readily appreciate that players across a whole school contribute to those outcomes. I'm in favor of anything that brings academic and student affairs and financial aid and res life and campus police and alumni affairs into one room to share their perspectives, their analysis, and come up with proposals to better serve students. I should add one set of people who also need to be in that room, embodied by the program this morning, which is the students themselves. What do we need? What is standing in our way? What smoothed our path? And what did we trip over? There's another darn good reason to attend to gradu graduation rates, and that's because graduation matters to students. It matters because it communicates to them and to others that they have persisted, mastered, and earned your respect. It matters because it is the doorway for them to careers of meaning and effectiveness that we promised them. And yes, it matters because it is, is a step that we have taught them will lead to greater economic security and resilience in times of uncertainty, to being able to provide for their families and make choices wider than they had before. It's not that we have to deliver them to companies for specific job openings, but we have to make sure that the step that is essential to them, completion and graduation of a degree with meaning, is one in which we are their partners and allies. Just as we ask students to expect our measures of education that matter, excellence, breadth and depth, we owe it, and so many more, we owe it to them to understand the measures that matter to them and to their lives. Part of what is difficult, of course, is very practical. The measures available to us are in their adolescence, and adolescents are unruly. Direct measures of student learning outcomes are relatively new, hard to compare across institutions, although getting better and wiser and deeper all the time. Indirect ones have their own problems. Loan repayment and employment are affected by many factors beyond academic expectations and student learning. So they may tell us something about a school. If repayment is really impossible for a large number of students, then that school should probably be rethinking what it charges and how it uh, thinks about the scale of the program, the financial aid opportunities, the commitment, the, the expectations that they raise in students about what they may be able to do. Um, and looking at the wider world. But more important, we know that things like uh, ability to manage loans and what you make from work after graduation are affected by many factors beyond academic expectations and student learning, including family wealth, widespread societal bias, and regional job opportunities. So we don't need to be reminded that data can be incomplete, can lead to misunderstanding and distortion, or misguided, leading to unintended consequences. Salary data, I was terrified in working with a scorecard, could exacerbate an already troubling problem in our country that we think too much about what people make and not enough about service and meaning and contribution and intangible values. But refusing to use information for what it can tell us is inefficient and short-sighted. Refusing information to our students because they might not fully understand it would be patronizing and poor modeling of the messy search for knowledge. So that said, there are things we can do about having better numbers. If we're going to use them to understand our achievements, we need better numbers. I understand the critique that it sometimes feels like we're using the few measures we have that are widely available, um, and that it's like looking for our keys under the lamppost because that's where the light is. So these are the numbers, why don't we use them? Some numbers are flawed, but some places we can add to our uh, picture by being smarter. So one thing that WASC did uh, before I came and with the uh, insights of one of our commissioners, John Echemendi, who was then provost at Stanford, was to say is there a fresh way we can look at graduation rate? I heard in every single uh, part of this country, uh, and first at CSU Dominguez Hills, where at Tim and Willie Hagen's invitation, we held the first scorecard national uh, open meeting, that the data that we had on graduation from iPads were so seriously flawed, so limited, that it was irresponsible to um, make too much of them. Full-time, uh, 
they were based only on first time, full time, fall enrollment students. As one college president once told, once told me, I have 1,700 students, of them 10, not 10%, 10, 10, were first time, full time, fall enrollment students. Are you seriously going to measure me on the basis of the graduation rate of my 10 of my 1,700 students? Uh, the answer is that would not be a very smart thing to do. So WASC developed something that we call our graduation rate dashboard, which includes an absolute graduation rate. It gets us away from time and gets us away from cohorts and says of the students who begin, what percentage of them complete ever, or at least in our ability to uh, have data about them. And those numbers can be quite different. They don't serve exactly the same purpose. They don't accelerate the timing quite the way you would like to in CSU. But they add another dimension to the conversation that shows us places that tenaciously, through the combination of effort by students and faculty and teammates, that students complete. And for many of the schools that are criticized for having very low graduation rates, this new dimension actually gives them hope and a sense that they are contributing and that they are working on timing, but that they know how to get people across that finish line. There are lots of other ways that we can look for better numbers that might expand our definition of student success. Are there wider ways that we can understand community service and leadership and engagement and voting participation and leadership in the community so that we have a better notion to surround the picture of what people want to do? Eric told me that he's interested in nonprofit work and planning to use his sociology degree in the community that he comes from. I have, just based on his handshake and that you chose him to introduce me, I have every confidence that he will be successful in his terms, mine, and probably all of ours. But whether there are numbers that can tell us that, that can have him feel like he's in the positive side, we don't have those yet. And that is a shortcoming because it understates our contributions. And we use too cramped a notion of success. But I would, that is not a reason to avoid using numbers when they're helpful. Uh, it's to build, as we always have in every area of research and academic inquiry, when we see a gap to work on understanding and use our constructive critical capacities to be smarter and not just to resist the question at all. Let's be honest, the work that we're asking people to do is not easy. Tim Rennick and Ryan Smith challenged us to ask hard questions. Are we the problem? And I say we on behalf of WASC as well. We ask ourselves, what we contribute positively, but where also we may add burden or distraction or other things that might stand in the way of your completing your mission. And if there are, we'd like to hear about them. Are our institutions truly designed for student learning and whatever definition of success we choose to use? And if not, are we willing to make change? Are we prepared to be and engage constructively with angelic troublemakers? I'm gonna take that phrase home. On the shuttle drive over here this morning, I heard from Lynn Mahoney from Los Angeles that she sensed a change in the conversation from the early, earliest graduation rate initiatives in the system, which she understood to sound like, how can we change the students? What do we have to do right as they begin so that they fit into our schools? To now asking how we can change ourselves. And that's an, an enormous transition. Let me close um, in these ways. I am not a big PowerPoint person, but I'd like to try and paint a picture for you. I was recently at a foundation-funded event where we were thinking about um, these issues and how we judge quality in higher education. And one of the exercises that people like to do at cool convenings um, left us with lots of pictures all over the tables and we had to choose a picture that for us captured how we would achieve equitable quality education sometime in the future. It's a mind exercise like Lauren Blanchard asked us to play yesterday. I could have chosen mountaintops or computers, I could have chosen beautiful fields or 
uh, wild abstract art. I chose a picture of a humble pottery bowl filled with what looked like a nourishing stew or chili that had four wooden hand-carved spoons around it. And I said that I picked it because the path to equitable quality education happens bowl by bowl, person by person, or four people together sharing a stew that includes the nourishing learning of education, the attention of coaches and advisors, and caring adults and challenging professionals. And at the same time, we have to understand and step back that we must count the bowls. We need to know how many bowls we're gonna need next year. We need to know which of those bowls had stew that was never eaten because it didn't fit with somebody's ethnic or dietary preference or they were too rushed, they had to race home to the kids, they couldn't stay and eat the stew. We have to look at the ones that didn't provide that nourishment and say, why not? What should we do differently? And for me, it's that combination of the very real and practical, each bowl, but also the whole picture uh, that we need to look at and understand in order to accomplish what we're here to accomplish. The responsibility and the opportunity of a closing speaker is to send us off with heightened pride, which you certainly deserve to feel, and energy to act with the urgency of the moment. So, I leave you the bowls and one more picture. I spoke a few years ago at the Dominguez Hills graduation for the education and human services students. The bowls, if you will, had become students and their families, big families, joyous families. Ellen is nodding. Many of them with umbrellas, so it was very colorful because it was held outside in the very bright, glaring sun. Uh, they were proud of what they had learned and the challenges they had met, the research and curriculum design and writing and math skills they had mastered. They were going off to teach in LA schools and populate her social service agencies and community advocacy groups and find apartments and pay back their loans and maybe run for public office. They came together under the heading of graduation and that is what they celebrated, just as it is what we celebrate here. I always have liked AAC and U's description of higher education's mission as preparing students for an unscripted future. Today, not only is there no script, everything about the theater, the city, the economy, and the freedoms that surround them are contested, at risk, or under discussion. Education of genuine meaning, integrity, quality, and coherence for all is one of our best hopes. And CSU is one of our best hopes for delivering them. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Is it on? Can you, can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm so, Thank you, Eric. Yeah, I'm sorry to call you back up on That's stage. That's okay, no, happy to do it. I think you have a lot of valuable information. And as you mentioned, you know, we should be making research-informed decisions, data-driven decisions. Um, what data related to student success and achievement do you think are most important to capture and inform these efforts? So once again, um, yeah. you know, what sort of data related to student success and achievement um, do you think are most important to capture our, and inform our efforts? I talked about a few in my remarks, but let me use um, that question to mention two that are daunting, complicated, but if we could do them right, could be very interesting. One is alumni, our own students' sense of what they have learned and mastered and whether what we told them, and this is important, what we told them at the beginning they would learn as college students, whether they actually got it and whether they can feel it, use it, see it, beyond. Not saying every single class you took has to be related to the work that you do later, but who knows better whether we met those promises to teach 
critical thinking and global communication and quantitative skills and the ability to learn and research future questions than the people we thought were smart enough to benefit from that education in the first place. Um, it is not an easy task to think what you would ask. I don't think there is some paper and pencil. I can think of all the reasons it could be very hard. So they may not be perfect numbers, but right now we know very little about that except for enthusiastic alumni and alumni giving rates, and neither of those is very good measure of education. And what do the people they work with know about what they have brought and what skills they had? Again could be done very badly and in ways that could be damaging, but if it could be done in a smart way, I think we could both learn more about our graduates and their capacities, but we might be able to help in this um, conversation that's taking place now about the value of post-secondary education um, that I think could change some of the assumptions we make about the nature of the education that we want to give to the population of the future. Anyone else? Comments as well as questions are uh, completely welcome. Thank you. Thank you again, and thank you, Eric.